Amen. All right, thank you, brother. We are going to get started. Uh, <clears throat> we're going to be in Romans 5, and you see up there Romans 5, 9. That's where we left off last week. And we'll just go ahead and read that again. Romans 5, 9. It says, Much more than being now justified by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath through Him. Uh, I'm going to just take just a moment here just to get into a little... I've had a lot of questions lately, and, and I think that a lot of times we get it online. Um, anytime we mention the King James Bible, uh, if you start mentioning verses that have been changed, those kind of things, and those things really just set, sets the alarm bells off. And you get a lot of negative comments and, and all that. So I want to kind of uh, go into it just a little bit. I'm not trying to trying to get too geeky on it or too deep in it because you can get drowned in all these things. Pastor talked about it the other night. I think it was Wednesday or maybe it was Sunday talking about manuscript evidence and some of those things. And I've had some questions about that. How do you deal with someone when it comes to manuscript evidence in the Bible and those kind of things? And so if you're talking about different versions of the Bible, unless somebody has any understanding of what some of the things we'll just touch on here, um, you're, you're really kind of wasting your time. Okay, so a lot of the things that people are out there saying, they're just parroting. They're just saying what somebody else has already told them and some of the lies that are out there about the different versions of the Bible and that kind of stuff. Um, and so I, I told you a little bit about my background as far as um, on the secular side, I've got a degree in history. And when you learn in history, um, when you're talking about sources, with, whether it's a primary source or secondary source or tertiary, which means third, um, even in primary sources, you can have bias. So that's where you have to understand bias. When you're looking at anything historical, say, for instance, uh, the only thing we have about the history of the Celtic Holocaust, that Julius Caesar uh, went through most of Europe and conquered that area and put many of your ancestors and my ancestors into slavery, um, well, the only history that you have from that is from Julius Caesar himself because there was no other written history. And so he was writing the history, his story, at the time and so obviously if you're reading something from him you're going to have some bias he's going to paint himself out to be the good guy and the other side the bad guy well the same thing when you get into what we're calling talking about manuscript evidence what's the importance of that and pastor mentioned first timothy 3 16 and without controversy great is mystery of godliness god is manifest in flesh okay all your new bibles are going to take that out why is that important because we're talking about the deity of christ so <clears throat> i want to just give you this is a 24th edition of the, uh, it's called Nissel Allen's Greek ap Apparatus, and this is, this one here I have is printed 1957. I've got a 26th edition here. This is the NIV. This is the Greek text where the NIV comes from, and then I've got a 28th edition. This is where your ESV comes from. Okay, and so why is that important? Well, I want to show you something that you won't find in actually the 26th or the 28th. You'll find it in the 25th edition and then they get rid of it in the introduction. And this is something they don't tell them when some of these men go off to school to learn Bible and they start getting into this Greek apparatus, they don't take them to this part right here in the, in the actual uh, introduction. So on page 59 in this one, I'm just going to read it to you real fast. <clears throat> it says, Origin of the edition, the present pocket edition of the Greek New Testament appeared for the first time in 1898, edited by my father, Ebhart Nessel. Okay, that's the original one. D.D. 1851 and 1913, it had been his intention to offer the result of the scientific investigation of the 19th century instead of the still widespread, now watch this, cheap editions of the so-called Texas Receptus, which goes back to Erasmus, which I have right here. That's what this is. Okay? And it says this, he therefore deliberately refrained from giving a wording of the text dependent on, uh, on his own, and therefore, uh, subjective critical examination of the different very versions, but took as the basis the great scientific editions of the 19th century of Tischendorf, of Leipzig, and Westcott and Hort. Now, that's, if you know anything about the revised version of 1881, that is Westcott and Hort. Okay, and so they're what he's calling the cheaper editions, or the Textus Receptus, is what we'd call the majority text. Okay, the received text. Like I guess I'm not trying to get too geeky here, but there's over 5,000 manuscripts 
that make up the received text. Okay? The ones that he's talking about with uh, Westcott and Horde and Tischendorf, okay, those make up about 1%. Okay? So what, what you're seeing there in the critical apparatus when you're talking about the Greek is you see bias. So what they do is they, then they go against their, trans, their own translating rules. Is like, for instance, when the King James translators came together, they compared all these Greek manuscripts that they had, and the ones that the majority agreed with is what they put in the text. Okay? And so, for instance, 1 Timothy 3.16, that's the big one. You'll see it change in every new Bible. There's 300 of the Greek texts that all agree from the received text. Okay, this is what Erasmus had. Okay, there's 300 of the, that agree. God was manifest in the flesh. Why is that important? Because we're going to be talking about the atonement here in just a moment. If he was not manifest in the flesh, his atonement would not mean anything to you. Okay, so of 300 agree, there's seven that disagree. Okay, so you have, what you have is 97.5% agree with what is in that King James. You have 2.5% 2, 2 that disagree. You know what text they went with? The ones that disagree. So they put he who was manifest in the flat. Well, who's he? Okay, and so you can, you can begin to see there's, there's a lot of bias here. Well, pre preacher talked about the other day about Arius. About uh, council at Nicaea, 325 A.D., they were trying to, to hammer out the deity of Christ, the doctrine of the deity of Christ. So Arius did not believe Jesus Christ, the Lord, was God manifest in the flesh. So you, you're, early on in the Greek text, you begin to see some, some uh, variations and some corruptions very early on. Okay, And so what, they, so what these editors did was they took the ones they agreed with, and they put them in the text, which you have here. Now, on these codexes, at the bottom, they'll tell you, if you know how to read them, they'll tell you which Greek text that they took out. And you'll see that you'll look down here at the bottom, and you'll look at this thing, and you'll say, oh, the majority text is the one they took out. They put the one in that they agreed with. And why you'll see so many variations on the market of new Bibles is because it's just up to their interpretation of which ones they think they should put in or they should take out. They don't even follow their own rules of translation when you get into manuscript evidence. The majority text is what you find here. And this is the Erasmus. I have a parallel Bible. You have, you have Greek in the middle and you have English on the side. So it shows you. Okay, so this is the Erasmus. Who's Erasmus? Remember we talked about church history. Who's Erasmus? Well... He's a Catholic priest who had those Greek texts that came out of Antioch, or not Antioch, uh, Constantinople, 1453, that thing was sacked by the, by the Ottoman Turks. Okay? Those Greek texts that the Greek Orthodox Church had for 1,500 years or around about there, those things made their way out. Okay, then you have the Renaissance and the Enlightenment, all those periods. Erasmus has had those texts, and so his New Testament came from the same text that your King James comes from. Okay, I'm, look, I'm getting a lot of stares, but, but understand there's corrupted texts that come out of this place. Alexandria, Egypt. Okay, now that should tip you off right there. Egypt is a type of what? The world. Anything that comes out of there is not a good thing. Okay, so all your corrupted texts come out of that place. And they're called Sinaiticus and Vaticanus. That's the major two codexes that are corrupted. Okay, and those were found around, the, those were written about, the, about 350 A.D., somewhere in that period. And so if you have a new Bible at your house, I urge you to go to Acts 8.37 which is taken out of every new Bible, talking about the Ethiopian eunuch, and look down at the footnote, and, and they'll say why they took it out. And they'll say, well, because the older and better manuscripts. That's a lie. Those older and better manuscripts they're talking about is Codex, Sinaiticus, and Vaticanus. Those are the corrupted texts. Okay, and just one, one last thing. Like I said, I'm not trying to get too geeky here on you. Um, but... 
Whenever uh, Ebhart Nessel, when he wrote that Greek New Testament, a lot of those, those uh, Sinaiticus of Atticanus were called, were in uncials or uncials. Okay, that, well, all that is is uppercase in the Greek. Okay, when you get into what the actual Bible, the New Testament was written, is called koinoi. That's a common Greek. And Greek at that time was written in minuscules, lowercase. Okay, and so what he's saying, what he, what he does is he lies to the people. He takes those uncial manuscripts, which are older, which are corrupted by a guy named Adamantus Origen. Okay, they've been corrupted, and he takes those and puts them in minuscules and passes them off to be, oh, this is the original Greek. It's a flat-out lie. Okay, now I can guarantee you the, the alarm bells are going off online right now. I can guarantee you that. But like Preacher said the other night, most people that are t saying things that they're saying have no understanding of that Greek apparatus. They don't speak a lick of Greek. They don't have a, a clue what they're even talking about. And they don't have any clue about history and manuscript evidence. So when you're reading your King James Bible, you can, you can rest assured that the translators, those King James translators who were geniuses in Greek, as well as uh, Martin Luther was as well, when Luther translated his New Testament, it came from Erasmus' text. He translated it into German. Okay, William Tyndall, who's ever heard of him? He got his from the same place, same Greek text that Erasmus, that Luther got from Erasmus. Okay, so you have the Tyndall's Bible. Now, it doesn't 100% agree with your King James. There's slight variations. Okay, but the majority of those Bibles agree with each other. Why? Because they come from the same source. The new Bibles come from a corrupted source. So whenever you see those things or you hear people say, well, the, you know, this, oh, here's another thing. Um, they talk about translations and the reason that a lot of people like to read new Bibles. Well, the ye's and the thou's and all those kind of things. Okay, those things are, uh, they're harder to read. Okay, you've heard that, right? That's why they switch over to even the new King James, which is also corrupted. Because it's also using a corrupted source. Okay, the, those things actually, um, okay, those things are actually, the King James is more correct. Why? Because from the Greek, you're, you're going to have, well, we'll just put it here, second person singular, okay, that's the thou. Okay, second person, plural, that's the ye. So when you see the thou and the ye in the Greek, and I'm not going to get into the Greek and all that stuff because I don't want, to, I don't want you drowning in those things, but from the Greek translation, they're going to have second person singular, and they're going to have second person plural. Okay, a hete, okay, a he, a, a he's. Okay, a he's is second person uh, singular. And a hete, second person plural. Okay, and when you see those in the King James, that's why the King James is written like that. Because it's more specific. It's correct. So when those King James translators had that thing, they understood how to translate from the Greek to the English. Okay? And by the way, they went through 14. Every, every time a translator would get it, there would be 14 other translators look at their work, they compare it and say, oh, you messed up here, you or they would agree. And they'd come together and then they'd say, all right, if all 14 agree, or 54 of them, but 14 times, they'd put it in your King James text. So don't think that this thing is just, well, we're just a bunch of dumb rednecks and we still believe the King James Bible is the Word of God and we don't know anything, we're not educated. That's not true at all. Okay, so I wanted to kind of put that to bed just a little bit. Now there's always going to be people, oh, you don't, you know, they're going to fight and argue and they can do all that they want to. But I want you to have confidence in the book. Okay, now, we talked about this before. When I got saved, I understood this was the Word of God. How did I know that? The Holy Spirit told me. Showed me this thing, because this book is alive. You don't have to know all this stuff here. You don't have to know all that. But I want to give you confidence and understand, listen, there's, there is history, there is facts to back up what we say. It's not just me up here bumping my gums. And thus saith Tony Hopkins, no, understand that I have a little understanding and education in this, but that happened after I was saved. But I didn't, need some, I didn't need that to have confidence in the book. Okay, and the average person doesn't either. 
But for those that maybe are kind of on the fence about some things, well, there's, there's just a little smattering right there of, we're talking about manuscript evidence, can, which can get into a very complicated uh, subject. Mm. And also I want to give you my reference on that, <clears throat> that figure about the 300 text, Greek text, and the seven that disagree, that's on uh, page 476, and that's on Gail Ripplinger's uh, New Age Bible versions. Okay, if you want to look up the actual source. Okay? You always want to cite your sources because you, don't, you just don't want to be up here saying things that are, somebody can call you on. That's where that came from. So you know that. There's the source. Okay? Now let's get into the text. All right. Uh, Romans 5, 9. Much more than being now justified by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath through Him. All right. We talked about last time in Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5, we're going to see a couple things here. Condemnation, all right, so we have condemnation. Then the opposite of that is justification. Justification, right? So you were condemned to death, but Christ went and died in your place, therefore you could be justified. Okay, justification is your legal standing with God. You're, remember we talked about standing in state. Where you stand, you stand in Christ. You're justified from all things. Okay? That's important. We'll talk about disobedience and obedience when we get there. But let's continue reading here. Look at verse 10. For if, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son, much more being reconciled, we shall, shall be saved by His life. All right, because He lives, we can live also. Notice the text again, when we were enemies. That means at one point in time, you were an enemy of God. Okay, look at John 3. Look at John 3, verse 36. Notice what he says here. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. See the present tense? And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life. But the wrath of God abideth on him. So every lost man out there has the wrath of God abiding on them. Okay? They're just waiting for their sentencing day. They've already been condemned. Look at uh, John 3 once again. Look at 319. Well, look at verse 18. He that believeth on him is not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already. Because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation. That light is coming to the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be manifest, that they are wrought in God. So we see that there's condemnation upon every lost man, and this is the condemnation that lights come in the world, men love darkness rather than light. They chose to go this direction versus that direction, especially in America. We've had more Bible preached. You can, get a, you can get a King James Bible. You can even get a corrupted text. Okay, it's got a, at least enough truth in it for somebody to see some light. Okay, now, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend getting, eating your meals out of a trash can, but you can get a meal there. Okay, but you can see here that the condemnation that light's coming into the world, men love darkness rather than light. Well, who's the light of the world? Jesus Christ, John 8, 12. Okay, so they choose to, to reject that light and they go with the darkness. And so therefore they're condemned. But Christ came to set us free. We are, we are justified through Him. Okay? But understand this. So let's go back to Romans chapter 5. Verse 10. For if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son, much more being reconciled we shall be saved by His life. Okay, so because He lives, we live. Alright? Remember in the Old Testament, every time that they... That, a, 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 a high priest or a priest would die, then another one would come along, right? And so, but because we have a great high priest, which is Jesus Christ, he's God manifest in the flesh, he ever liveth, therefore we can continue. We live because he lives. We'll never die because he'll never die. Because you're in Christ, all right? <clears throat> That's the, that is the mystery that was revealed to Paul the Apostle. Before that, the, the apostles had no understanding of those things, Okay, they didn't have that light that Paul was given. That's why you have to hammer everything down in Pauline 
doctrine first. Before you start branching out into other parts of the Bible, you have to understand Pauline doctrine. Okay, let's go back to Romans 5. Look at verse 11. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. Okay? All right. So, that word atonement... It shows up once in your New Testament. There it was. Okay? It shows up like 81 times in the Old Testament. Okay? Here's something that you need to understand about the atonement. In the Old Testament, they were to make an atonement. In the New Testament, you receive the atonement. which is what Paul just told you. So, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even then that believe on his name. How many? As many as receive him. Free will. Here's the light. Here it is. You want the light? God will give it. You want the, you want the atonement? Receive Jesus Christ. You don't want the atonement? Well, then you're going to have to suffer everlasting punishment. You're going to have to pay for your sins on your own. Because Christ already paid for him at the cross. So when you reject the atonement, you reject eternal life. Because Jesus Christ is eternal life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Right? I am the resurrection, all the I am's that you find in John. Okay? So you receive the atonement back here in the Old Testament. They made an atonement. Well, who made the atonement for us? Jesus Christ. All of those types that you'll see in, uh, in Leviticus, that's where atonement shows up 43 times and more than any other book in the Bible. All those types, all the, the, meat, the meat offerings, the drink offerings, the sin offerings, all those offerings are types of Jesus Christ in some way, shape, form, or fashion. Okay? So all those things were pictures, types of the one who was to come, which is Jesus Christ. And when he made his atonement, it was once and for all. Amen. Amen? Let's go to Hebrews. Look at Hebrews. I think we read this last time, but let's look at Hebrews 7, 24. But this man, because he continueth ever, hath an unchangeable priesthood. Wherefore he is able to save them to the uttermost that come unto him, come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. Now there's the high priest. There's the priest, that's where he's at now, making intercession for us, right? Because he lives, we can live. For such a high priest became us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens, who needeth not daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifice first for his own sins and then for the, for the people. For this he did once when he offered up himself. See that? One time, one atonement. All right, now go back over here to Hebrews chapter 5. Let's look at um, verse 4, 5, 4. And no man taketh this honor unto himself, talking about the priesthood, but he that is called of God, as was Aaron. So also Christ glorified not himself to be made an high priest, but he, he that said unto him, Thou art my son, today have I begotten thee. As he saith, saith also in another place, Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Now notice this, who in the days of his flesh... When he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death and was heard and that he feared. Now, which death is he talking about? First death or second death? Go to Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20. Look at verse 14. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life, with life was cast into the lake of fire. That second death, when he became sin on the cross, we don't have an understanding. We, never, we will never understand completely what took place on the cross. Only thing we can do is believe what the book says. But he came, became sin for us. He suffered the second death. 
so that we wouldn't have to suffer it. He became sin for us who knew no sin. Okay, that's how big of a deal the atonement is. What he did on the cross, he paid for your sins. Okay, and so we see that here, but notice it says, in the, who in the days of his flesh. All the new Bibles change that one. It says, who, who in the days of his life. God, he was God manifest in the flesh. Okay, so you can see those corruptions in those texts. If you didn't know anything, you would just glance right over that and say, well, what's the big deal? It's a huge deal. Because we're talking about God manifest in the flesh. Jesus Christ. Okay? Because without that, the atonement wouldn't mean anything. Amen? He's 100% God and 100% man. Go to uh, Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1 verse 3. Concerning His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh, and, de and declared to be the Son of God with, with power, according to the Spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead. If He wasn't God manifest in the flesh, He could not come up on His own power. He came up on His own power. And He ascended on His own power. Okay? Because what? Because He's God in the flesh. Because He's righteous. 100% righteous. Kept the law. Never sinned. He was tempted with it. But he never, even, he never even messed with it. You and I have an Adamic nature because we come from our father Adam. We're in Adam. When you get born again, you, become in, you get in Christ. Okay? All right. Uh, let's go back to Romans 5. Let's go back to the atonement here. Romans 5.11. Here's something interesting about it. Once again, I've, I've showed you some of this before. All right. Now, the first time that that thing shows up, now this thing, when you get into the translating, this is interesting about it. Here's the Hebrew, kafar. Okay? All right. That is, uh, it can be translated either pitch or it can be translated as atonement. Okay, same word, same Hebrew word. All right, go back to uh, Genesis chapter 6. Look at uh, Genesis chapter 6, verse 14. First mention of the word pitch shows up here. Make thee an ark of gopher wood. Room shalt thou make in the ark, and shalt pitch it, notice this, within and without with pitch. Now in Ephesians 1.13, you're sealed with the Holy Spirit until the day of redemption. Within and without. Remember we talked about the spiritual circumcision. Cuts you loose from the flesh. We'll get into that in Romans 7. Okay, notice it's sealed from the inside and the outside. All right, let's keep, let's keep reading. Verse 15, And this is the fashion which thou shalt make it of. The length of the ark shall be 300 cubits, the breadth of 50 cubits, and the height of, 30, of it 30 cubits. A window shalt thou make to the ark, and a cubit shalt thou, shalt, uh, shalt thou finish it above. And the door of the ark shalt be in where? The side thereof, and with lower, second, and third stories shalt thou make it. See, the, there's three parts to it. There's three parts to you. Three parts of the Godhead, Father, Son, Holy Ghost. And notice how they got into it in the side. Right? Let's go to John 19. John 19. Look at verse 34. But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side, and forthwith came there out blood and water. And he that saw it bare record, and his record is true, and he knoweth that he saith true, that he might believe that ye might believe. How do you get into the body? Through the side, through the blood and through the water. Amen. Notice the blood is God's blood, the water, that's natural birth. All right. Go back to John chapter three. 
Compare Scripture with Scripture. Look at John 3, 5, talking about being born again. We know that. Jesus answered in John 3, 5, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except me a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. First there's a natural birth, then there's a spiritual birth. Okay, you're, when you were born, your mother broke water before you came into this world. The first time you see natural life show up on the earth, it comes out of the ocean, it comes out of the water. That's what that thing, it doesn't represent baptism, it's not baptismal regeneration. Okay, that's what all the cults believe in. They, they think getting dunked in that pool is going to save them. Nope, that just makes you wet. You were saved before you got in that pool. That's just a public witness and testimony that you are saved. You identify with Christ. He went down in the water, came back up. Notice that, okay? So you, let's go back to Noah. He was saved from wrath, just like it says in Romans chapter 5, the wrath to come, that judgment, okay? He got into the ark. Who sealed it? God did. You can go back to Genesis chapter 7, and you can look at verse 16, and the Lord shut him in. They went into the side. God sealed it. It's pitched within and without. You're sealed with the Holy Ghost until the day of redemption. What came down on the earth was judgment. You're saved from the wrath to come. See the type? So you go up and over and come back down in the millennial reign of Christ with him. And that's what Noah was given all the earth. He was given dominion over all the earth. Notice that? Okay, and in the regeneration, when we come back with Jesus Christ, we have dominion with him if you suffer with him. We'll get into that in Romans 8. Okay, so going back to the atonement. All right, let's go back to John, or not John, uh, Romans 5. A lot of folks um, struggle with their salvation. Why? Because they don't understand the doctrines that Paul's laying down here. Okay, and they think when they mess up, they think, well, I lost my salvation. No, you lost your fellowship. Not the same. Salvation Standing, you're in Christ. You can't get out of the ark. God had, you couldn't get out, you couldn't get, you can't get out of God's hand. You're part of His hand. Amen? Amen. You cannot get out once you get in. Sorry, you're going to heaven whether you like it or not. <laughs> Kicking or screaming, you might not be happy when you get there because you might have been a bad boy or a bad girl and you're going to get judged up there because you didn't judge your sin down here, but regardless, you're going. Amen. Now, there's some things you can lose. Inheritance-wise, but you cannot lose Christ's inheritance, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Amen. Amen? Okay, so go back to Romans 5. All right, verse 12, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Okay, that sin entered into the world, that's why we die. Okay? You have Adam's blood coursing through your veins. All right, let's look at the let's look at salvation. Ah. You got past, present, and future. Okay, past. You received Jesus Christ. You were saved, sealed. Calvary. Okay, justification. Your legal standing is in Christ. Why? Because of what he did at Calvary. But then you have a present. Okay, sanctification. You had a sanctification through the Spirit that put you into the body of Christ. It separated you when you believed on Christ. put you into the body. However, there's a daily sanctification. Okay? Sanctify them through thy word. Thy word is truth. How do you get sanctified? Daily. I die daily. You have to be constantly getting washed. Why? To be sanctified, for meat, to be meat for the master's use. That's on a daily sanctification. That's present. Because he lives, I can live also. When I don't know what to pray, he prays for me. Romans chapter 8. Thank you, Lord. That's right. Okay? Because I don't know what to pray half the time. Okay. Because I don't know God's will, do I? I just pray that it's in God's will. All right, and then future. New body. That one there is saved from the presence of sin. That's what you get in the future. Okay, go to Romans chapter 8. 
skip ahead just a little bit. Romans 8, verse 23. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves, grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. For we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why did he yet hope for? But if we hope for what we see not, then do we with patience wait for it? For what? That new body. You know, the whole creation groaneth and travaileth together until now. It's waiting for the regeneration of the earth. When the manifestation of the sons of God come back with Jesus Christ, He's going to regenerate the earth. You see all these weather patterns? People keep talking about global warming. Oh, it's going to get a whole lot hotter in the tribulation. Just wait. He's going to crank it up so, to where it's so hot that even if it wasn't for the days being short, even the very elect, for the very elect, elect's sake, that He'd kill everybody on the earth because it's going to be so hot. That's tribulation. That's Matthew 24. All right, what's going on? You, what do you see going on around you with all the weather? Those are called groanings. The earth is groaning. Those are delivery pains. She's going to deliver a child. You get over to Isaiah 66, talking about the nation of Israel. When she's reborn again, okay, as a nation, and Christ comes back as king, he's going to regenerate that earth. Until then, it's going to get worse and worse. So what? So just buckle up. You see, you know, what, what are they doing? They're giving... They're giving Mother Nature all of the credit. All right, let's go back to Romans chapter 1. We, we went through this in Romans 1, but let's go back through it. Romans 1.20 For the invisible things of Him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse, who's out, all the Gentiles and everybody on earth, because they can see creation, they can see it right in front of them, and you have to be a fool to believe that something came from nothing. You, you have to be a fanatic to believe that. Okay? Because that when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, neither were thankful. That's where it starts. But became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. That's where they're at now. She's going down. Why? They reject what the Word of God says. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. You see all these college... Campuses, what's going on? What were they? What have they been teaching for years and years and years? Evolution, Marxism, okay, communism. Now the dogs return their own vomit, and you see what they're doing? They're turning on themselves, and they're burning their campuses down. I say, let them burn, because any place that doesn't that does not teach the word of God, okay. Without this, that's the reason that you even had universities in the first place. You understand that, right? Harvard, Yale, all the Princeton, all those things were to, to teach ministers, to create ministers. Whether Anglican, Presbyterian, um, any of those places, that, the higher learning, that's what it, the institutions were for. Now what do they produce? Just a bunch of little communists who reject the Word of God and they reject what he says in his book. Keep reading. And change the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man. Notice the decline into birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts, to the dishonor of their own bodies between themselves. Sodomy, all those kind of things. Who changed the truth of God into a lie? Here it is. And who, who worshipped and worshipped and served the creature more than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. See, it's not that they didn't worship the Creator. They just worshiped the creation more than the Creator. See, that's how Satan does it. He says, well, you can have it your way. You can have your cake and eat it too. And so you have all the ecumenical movement, everybody coming in and trying to sing Kumbaya together and get together. And they start to look at, well, your way's right, and that's, that's okay, and so on and so forth. And then they talk about Mother Earth. Okay? All those things. Listen. All that stuff, they're worshiping the creation more than the creator. And that's what they're doing. And that's here you go again. So history repeats itself. Why? Because man is no good. His flesh is no good. He needs an atonement. He needs to be born again. So why? He can see things how God sees them. But we have the mind of Christ, which is right here. Now we don't understand everything yet. Who could? Have you, have you ever read Isaiah? You ever read Ezekiel? Uh, those things blow your mind. There's stuff in there, man, that you... That's too deep for me, man. Okay? 
However, the simple things right here, the creation, you can clearly see it. So when you see things taking place out in the world as far as weather patterns, don't get freaked. They don't think global warming. Oh, like I said, it's going to get way hotter. Way hotter. Amen? Why is that? Because sin. You see, the more sin enters into the world, the more pain and sorrow and suffering takes place. You see, it, you see dead planets out there, don't you? Right? Well, at one time... They weren't so dead. But who sinned first? Lucifer. He's the prince of the power of the air. One day God's going to plant those heavens. But they're dead right now. Why? Because sin entered in. And then sin entered into our race through Adam. That's why you must be born again. Amen? All right. I think we made it about three verses. I try to get through these things, but there's so much to cover and pack in these, in these verses that you have to understand because, and, I, and I'll make the point once again, we get so many emails and so many phone calls from folks that don't understand the security that they have in Christ. So this is why you keep seeing these things come up. Why? To give people assurance of their salvation. Start there, and then we'll move on. But you've got to get that thing straight so that you can get peace in your heart. Justified by faith. Okay? All right, so I think we left off in, let's say, verse 12. We'll get back into it next week. Perhaps we'll get through chapter 5. All right, let's go ahead and pray. Father, Lord God, we just thank you for this day, Lord, and just thank you for liberty today. And I just pray for the folks that have come and listened online. And uh, I just pray that you'd soften their hearts to receive the message. Uh, I know there's always an issue with the King James, and I just pray that you'd uh, reveal to them the truth, maybe taught them some things that they didn't know, and, and the folks that were maybe on the fence gave them some more confidence in the book. Not that they need it from a man, but Father, I just pray that you'd reveal it to them. I just pray for the service today. I just pray for Brother Barry as he leads the singing, and I pray for our pastor as he breaks the bread of life one more time. Just fill him with your Holy Spirit one more time, and give us what we need. And Father, we just thank you. In Lord Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus' sake we ask it. Amen.